curb every once in a while, and our flesh allows that to happen. That isn't you kicking me to the curb, even though you might want to kick me to the curb mm -hmm. and have indicated that. But it's still, I can't be kicked to the curb unless I allow you to or anybody else, and specifically the devil. I just, I don't even like talking about him because it's pointless, it's worthless. There is no point talking about him, other than. I guess sometimes people need to know that obviously there is an adversary. He is real, but he is like a, 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 a it's like almost imaginary because, you know, as we get closer now to celebrating the risen Christ, the, the one, um, you know how sometimes you'll, okay, I, I watched the Passion here this week, and even if a, 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 a tenth what you see, because, you know, I'm a visual person, even if a tenth of that, and we know that the scourging, all those things take place, I don't need to see a movie to know that it took place, it's, it's in the Bible, but, you know, it, it's so powerful to actually see it, and it's like, I mean, every time I see it, it's like, I, it's just, it's amazing, and to know that, you know, as Jesus went into the garden to pray, and sweat blood, yeah. it's medically possible to do that, but it's nearly impossible to do. That is some serious stress you're going through. That's right. And so as the man, Jesus, knew what was before him, he knew exactly what was before him. Otherwise, why would he be stressed out? Mm -hmm. He knew what was before him. That's God. Yeah. He knew what was coming, and he knew that he had to do it. And yet he says, nevertheless, let this, this cup pass from me. I've said that I don't know how many times. I don't want to go. I don't want to go through this. Why is it necessary for me to go through a dry place, a uh, you know whatever it is? We all have different versions of, of what we say is you know it could be financial, it could be family, it could be whatever that it is. But none of anything that we can come up with is too big for God to overcome. And then you know guilt can come in because you thought this, you said that. Get over it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, seriously, we just need to get past it and get on it. I know we. I've said this a gajillion times, but it nevertheless takes away from the fact that God has taken care of it all, every bit of it. I don't see anywhere where there's any room for. Well, yeah, but He really didn't. It. No, He addressed everything. Amen. When He went to the cross, it was finished. Right. And it's like I, I'm thankful for that because in, in the time you know just uh, you know we're gonna um, I'm sure we all have some prayers but you know my continual prayer is it's a, it's not a, it is a prayer but it's a proclamation that I do not understand and I'm never gonna understand I'm never gonna get over to it as to why I should have to worry about paying my life bill that's just absurd I'm a child of God Amen. I'm a child of God. I don't need to worry about those things. And then, so then when I do, then when the light bill gets paid, hey, guess what? My light bills, my lights are still on. Well, so I, I took a week out of my life to, God's like, I, I, you know, I'll get just like I did the last time, and times go bad, and times go bad, and, you know, it's like a, I have amnesia every once in a while, and, and forget that, God is awesome. Yes. I say it all the time, and I know that it's true. We all do. But, uh, um, you know, just continual proclamation that I am free from the boundaries of this world. Amen. Everything that you can think of tied to it. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, you agree with me tonight? Yes. Amen. 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 Praise God. I agree with you. And uh, we have no choice but to because... You know, when it gets down to the only thing that I can compare this to, uh, can find the answer that I can come to the knowledge of, is through Him, the Word of God. Amen. Jesus. Amen. 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 Right. Thank you, Jesus. Continual prayer for uh, for my wife. Um, you know, the blessing that we received is just, uh, you know, it's amazing. And um, she's gonna, um, she started this week, and you know, we'll see as, as it goes on. She got the blood draws, and and uh, to continue on, but. Just that God be a part of it the whole time. Um, it's just awesome to see a little bit of transformation just with, with the knowledge of knowing that with 
God, through God, that something can take place and is taking place. So just continue to lift, lift my life up. I appreciate it. Um, anybody else? I know there's a lot in here. Yeah.
says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. They were doing what they weren't qualified to be doing. And the result is, the very next verse, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. So, it, that's right. But we've entered in to that place where we do, we can do whatever's right in our mind because we have the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. And if we miss it, we have the grace of God to protect us and to cover us. There's no famine in the land. You know, He is our source. He supplies all of our needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So, you know, God lays it out here in His Word all the way back to Deuteronomy that the reason I don't want you doing what you, whatever you think is right, because you're not in a position to do that yet. Right. You're, you haven't come to the place of rest. You haven't come to the place where uh, all is, is under the blood. You know, you're still operating from what you do is what you get. You know, what how you mm -hmm. behave is, is right. going to produce the, the kind of results that you're going to get. So it's really dangerous to be trying to make decisions based on whatever you think. Because the result of that will be lack. The result of that will be need. The result of that will be famine. But the beauty of this thing is he tells us that the day's coming, though, when we will eat the fat of the land. When we will have, we will rejoice. And, uh, you know, that's what he said when they read the law. He said, they're weeping, they're weeping, they're crying because the law's being read. And they're going, oh, oh, my God, we can't do this. And he says, no, 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 I don't want you crying. I want you to drink the wine, eat the fat. I want you to party. I want you to start acting the way you're going to be, the way I'm declaring you to be. He gives them those opportunities all the time. I mean, uh, over and over you see it. That's what the feasts were about. It was like a break from all of this. Just relax, because this is where you're coming. You're coming to a, t a time, uh, prophetically speaking, when all these rules and laws and everything are represented. It's going to take you to a place of rest, a place of joy, a place of partying all the time. I mean, that's what Jesus was doing. He comes to the sinners and what does he do? He parties with them. He eats with them. He drinks with them. And that's what the religious people were so mad about. He parties with sinners. You know, they say he ate with sinners, but that's what they were doing. They were having a, cell, they were having a, a, a party. And it, it was basically fulfilling everything that God had said he wanted for his own people. It's like the story of the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. the, the, the older brothers were there mad. No, I need a party with us. Well, you can have a party anytime. Yeah. Why don't you rejoice over the fact that I'm partying? These are your brothers. You're all going to be one. You're all going to be a part of one family. You know? So, anyway, I thought that was interesting. That, <clears throat> this talk of uh, just knowing what to do and to do whatever we do. It's covered. It's under the blood. And that's what he was trying to get across to them. He said, don't do it now because you're not there yet. And there are consequences for doing what you think is right in your own mind. But thank God we've come to the place where whatever we do, God puts his stamp of approval on it. In Christ, it's all good. You can't, I mean, that, do you understand how big that is? Yeah. You can't it's make mistakes. Mm -hmm. You really cannot make mistakes. It's exactly what Suzanne said. We are his children. Come to me, little children. You know, it's all good. It's okay. Those are just little kids. Don't worry about it. Yeah. They're my kids.
they said, are you saying this? Go ahead and send you whatever you want. You know, and unless we preach it to where people say that, we're not preaching the same message that Paul preached. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's just, uh, I can't remember where it was, but, you know, where he said, you know, run under Caesar, unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Yes, there's laws of the land. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we can't run around and act like idiots because there's a consequence to pay. But that's according to the laws, right, yeah. of the land. Right. There is no law. According to God, right, right. That's exactly what it says. Yeah. And then you know, but it, you know, it can be a vicious circle. But we can be overcomers yes. of the vicious circle. Yes. Amen. Amen. That is the good news. Praise God. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. You. Yes. Amen. And to be happy about that and right. to feel comfortable with that. But there's so much, you know, scales that need to be ripped off of religion, of, you know, whatever that it is, you know, because we've all heard some of the same garbage, you know, and for a little while it sounds like it's okay, but then, no it isn't, because I, I, this doesn't sound right. Well, if it doesn't sound right, it's probably not right, and the only way that you can justify it is by looking in the Word of God that's to right. make sure that it's not, amen? Amen. But uh, the Word's true, that's all I know. That's amen. Right. Amen. But uh, anybody else? Yes, sir. Just uh, lift up Cindy tonight. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we have a, a, I've got a request to know where, I get on for the web, the sign with, with the webcast, I go through uh, <coughs> Facebook, right? Well, How else, if they don't go no, through Facebook? No, I, I'll have to check, but because I think I screwed it up and set it for you stream tonight, but I think Cindy sends it through Facebook. I told him they want a second, I can let them wonder if it's over. It's on you, it's, it's on you, it's on you stream. Uh, let's uh, continue to pray for Joni and Robert. There was some misinformation floating around out there today. I don't know if anybody else heard about it, but Sally got some text messages. I talked to Mike about it a little bit. That for some reason, somebody got the idea that she was going to hospice today. Then it, they went so far as to say she was dying today. That's all bogus. Anybody that hears any of that information or gets any of that information, it's not true. Tammy talked to the nurse. We were at the hospital this morning. <coughs> Joni was in dialysis at the time. It takes three or four hours for me to get <coughs> uh, to, to visit with her, but we left her a note. We talked to the nurse there, and Tammy talked to her later after all this stuff started coming around. And she, all it was is that they have, they're trying to connect her with a, I'll call it, there's a name for it, but I'll just give you the definition of the name, which is simply a healthcare coordinator. They're kind of, they're not really healthcare people. They don't take care of Joni, but what they do is coordinate her doctor's appointments. Because mm. she was concerned she's in the hospital there. She said, I haven't even seen my heart doctor. And they said, of course not. You're not in here for your heart. You're in here for your kidneys. You understand what I'm saying? So maybe she gets confused because mm -hmm. she's mixing up one condition with another. So she, they're going to have this group of people, this organization, they come in and they help to coordinate her doctor help her to kind of to translate some of that information into more lay terms that she can understand. And that's what it's all about. It was nothing about hospice. She's not going for hospice. She's not dying today or any other day, you know. So, you know, I just uh, say that to say, be careful what you repeat. <laughs> because there's stuff said all the time that just isn't true. If somebody gets a word, and then the next thing you know, because of our technology, everybody can know it <laughs> in 10 minutes. Instantly. But it doesn't make it true. So, you know, it happens. Uh, apparently, Robert heard something that caused him to believe that it was hospice. Whatever he heard, I don't know. But anybody that's had to deal with doctors, it's like talking to a lawyer. <laughs> you don't know what they're saying. You, you, mm -hmm. you think maybe you understand it, and but most of the time you don't. So. He jumped to conclusions that caused others then to react in well-meaning, you know what I'm saying, but nevertheless, it's, it's just not true. So if you see anything that anybody else has picked up in the past, it's, like, it's not true. She's, she's, you know, she's where she has been. She's, she's going through the dialysis, but this should be a good thing. And this will help to kind of, you know, yeah. provide a translator between the medical professionals and the people that are being treated. It's a shame that it has to happen, but it, sadly it does. My mother had 
a similar kind of situation where they came in and helped to coordinate because she was on, you know, she had different issues, you know. And because of that, you, you really kind of know, you don't go to the doctor for that. Just like now, she's in the hospital for the kidneys. Well, she's not there for the, for the heart condition, so they're not treating the heart condition, they're treating the kidneys, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But if you've got the heart condition, you're thinking, well, then why aren't they doing something about that? You see what I'm saying? So that's what this, this healthcare provider does. They, they coordinate between the different doctors and hospital visits, and they help to keep all that stuff separate so that she knows what she's being treated for at any given time and when she needs to be there, and then they help to make sure that she gets there. And all that. So to me, it sounds like the <coughs> they need to have. I mean, it just yeah. sounds like a really good thing. So, so, but we need to continue to pray because we need to be believing for healing. For total, complete healing for her to walk out. That's the will of God for this situation. We know it based on his word. I know when you're dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis, it's hard to get past the evidence of otherwise. But that's why we've got to look at things that are not as though they are. I mean, this is that's what the way we need to pray and continue to pray. And there just isn't another alternative or another option here. So we just don't give up. It's it's prolonged, it's dragging out. And I know there's times when she just feels like throwing her hands up and saying, yeah, I've had enough. But that's where we come in. That's where we have to lift up her arms, you know, just like we did with uh, Moses and just say, hey, we're going to stand here with you and we're not going to quit believing and we're not going to stop praying. And we're going to let you. Yeah. So that's what we can do as a body. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Great job. Anybody else?
insurance for the same spectrum for a death of a son. Uh, I know having been purchased or prepaid at the funeral for my mother, it's not cheap. And then how you pass that along to the city is a test to die. So uh, she is, uh, as I know you know, uh, you know, help in any way we can. It's not like you got to give, you know, just whatever you can if you feel that.
Oh! 
there's a hunger that's been awakening. And I've been seeing that for the past few weeks, mostly with the people that are close to me. People see how lives can be changed just by saying, yes, Lord, I want you in my life. But they have this fear that if they let go of the worldly things, that they're never going to get back what they're giving. But they need to realize that they're getting something so much greater by giving up the worldly things. And we have to help these people that have this hunger to know and see who the true God is. And we have to break those chains yes. and help them become free from the bondage of this world, the bondage of the devil. And I'm ready for that.
Sally knows because I, yeah. I do all of her tech yes. stuff. I do all of her tech work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, praise the Lord. All right, uh, here we go. <laughs> do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Can you get the uh, King James on there, Mike? Only because it's just easier for me to keep, keep track. Well, keep, keep all the old ones for That's okay. That was the new English standard, and of course, we're all for anything new in English. Right? Uh, <laughs> so, I'll read. Uh, I think it could be referred to as Neo English. <laughs> okay, so be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Yeah. Amen. Now we talked about that a little bit, but we know what the perfect, the acceptable and perfect will of God is. I know a lot of times it gets divided up, so you know, for purposes of preaching sermons, but the truth is, uh, what's good, acceptable, and perfect will of God is exactly what this Bible tells us. That we should be healed, we should be whole, we should be prospered, we should be, I mean, that's what God provided for. Amen. Through all of his work of the cross. So we don't want to be conformed to this world. And uh, being conformed to this world means you accept the stuff that's in the world. Just whatever your circumstance is dictating or whatever your uh, situation might be declaring. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what it ought to be. Not what we're seeing, not the facts, but the truth. Right? That's the only way it gets revealed. The only way God's will is revealed is through people who believe that it has a higher truth. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Okay, so if we want, as Christians, as believers, if we want liberty instead of bondage, instead of freedom, or excuse me, freedom uh, instead of fear and uh, condemnation and security instead of anxiety, then we need to be transformed by changing our thoughts and our attitudes by renewing our minds to rest in the finished work of Jesus, Amen. the finished work of the cross. Amen. It's really that simple. It isn't, uh, it isn't how much of the Bible you memorize, but it's how much of it you believe and function from that belief or from that truth. Amen. Let's, uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So here we are. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, I talked about Sunday a little bit, but let me, just for the sake of the context of this, repeat that we are, we're transformed not by what we're doing, you know, not by our effort in, at being a better person or a different person or, a, you know, a more Christian person or whatever.
but we are transformed by seeing what Jesus has done. In other words, what we're looking at what he has declared us to be rather than what we may see in the mirror or see in our everyday kind of experience. And that changes us. By beholding God's grace, his acceptance of us, that changes us, that sanctifies us. Amen? That's something that can't be undone. That's something that can't be damaged or, or flawed or anything else. We've been declared perfect, which you could say we've been declared sanctified, justified, and sanctified. So we have to focus on the justifier, amen, the one and what he's done in order for us to be changed. And when we do, we are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, not by us. Right. Not by our effort, not by our work, not by our uh, works, as it were, but by the finished work of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. So the more you keep your mind, the more you, uh, your thinking and your focus is on Jesus, the more you are transformed into his image. It's that simple. Praise the Lord. It is, you're not doing it. It's done by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's done by God. As we behold him, we begin to see who he says we are. Mm -hmm. And it transforms us from the inside out. Amen. And again, like I said, it may take a little longer than external putting on and taking off of or doing or not doing, but that's not sanctification. That's not justification. That's not transformation. Come on. That's m behavior modification. It's, it's you know, making yourself appear to be something other than what you are. And Jesus, he dealt with it, you know, with the Pharisees and others. You know, you're whited sepulchers. You know, you paint up the outside, but inside you're dead men's bones. God wants to do this, and God's the only one that can do it. You can't save yourself, and you can't transform yourself. It's what he's basically telling the Galatians. You were saved by grace. Now you're trying to make this transformation into this new creature or creation or creature that God has already declared you to be by doing a bunch of stuff that didn't get you saved in the first place. You've been perfected, so let God bring out or reveal that perfection that's already in you. And he does that by the power of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. So let's, let's see now how the enemy then comes against us when it, when it comes to this, because that's where the battle is. The battle is the enemy comes and accuses us of not being who God says we are. And our own mind, to the degree that it's not uh, renewed, will agree with him. It'll, it'll take up sides with the devil even. Mm -hmm. Amen? So let's, let's begin with uh, Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 39. And I want to try to put this into a context that makes a little more sense. Uh, Matthew 5, 39. And then we'll go to James 4, verse 7. But here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 39, he says, I say unto you, this is Jesus, and he says, that you resist not evil. See that? Resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Well, we know the evil, the evil one is Satan. So any evil that comes, it comes from a manifestation of his spirit or his uh, influence in the lives of people. Just like any good that comes, comes as a result of an influence of God or a manifestation of the spirit of God in a person's life. Now, that can happen on both sides. Uh, to both parts of humanity. In other words, the enemy can do this to unsaved people to a greater degree, but he can also do it in saved people. He can influence us, we know, because we have flesh. Our flesh is subject. That's what the enemy uses. So as long as we got flesh, we are still able to be messed with, right? Mm -hmm. And vice versa, God can also move in the lives of unbelievers to do good things. Because Jesus said there's only one that's good, 
and that's God. So any good that comes is, is as a result of the influence of the Spirit of God. You say, well, yeah, but they're not born again. That doesn't mean anything. The Holy Spirit constrains and restrains this anti-Christ uh, spirit that's in the world all the time. Or it would have overtaken us. Already. Amen. But he says, I say to you that you do not resist not evil. So that's kind of messes with my mind a little bit. But let's look at James chapter 4 and verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Now wait a minute. <laughs> what, what exactly is God saying? On the one hand, he says, don't resist evil. On the other hand, he says, submit yourself to God and resist the devil. So there has to be something about that that we're not understanding. And my, my reckoning of this is that the scripture says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. That's what he does. That's the only real power that he has is to accuse. Jesus stripped him of all other power. So what he does is accuse us or try to manipulate us. Amen. And so he is the accuser of the brother. But here's what God is telling us. Don't be occupied with resisting every bad thought that comes into your head or every uh, numbskull act or less than Christian kind of behavior. Don't be occupied with that all the time. Don't be focusing on that. Okay? Resist the devil. How? Don't listen to the accusations and the condemnation. That's how you resist the devil. Amen? If he's the accuser, and that's what he's doing, is constantly accusing, and that's what he always does. He tells you, that you, sh you should be doing this, you should be doing that, and then he accuses you of not doing enough or doing too much of something else or, or doing whatever. He's the accuser. So you cannot listen to the accusations and the condemnation of the enemy. That's how you submit yourself to God by believing what God has said about you and you resist the devil by not listening to those, those condemnations and those accusations that he brings against you. And when you do that, he flees. When you stop listening, he stops. He stops talking eventually. That's how you submit to God. That's how you resist the devil. It's that simple. We don't have to get into wrestling matches with that guy. We, we don't have to Scream and holler, we just got to quit listening. Amen. And listen to what God says about us. Make the focus Jesus, not ourselves. All right, let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 2. And uh, let's read this chapter. It's 16 verses, but it's important because it's talking to us about God's way of speaking to us. So you'll be able to discern the difference. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us. Now, I can just we could go down the whole list, but the things that's been given to us is guilt-free. No condemnation. The righteousness of God. We've been perfected. We've been declared to be righteous and perfect in the eyes of God. That's part of what he's given us. And we need to know that. We know that by the Spirit. 
We don't know it by the flesh. We don't know it intellectually necessarily, but we do know it by the Spirit. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. I talked about this as well Sunday. But who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now that's God's way of speaking, spirit to spirit. He speaks to your per perfect person, which is that spirit person. So anytime, all you're going to hear from God is good. It's positive. It's always going to be you are. Anytime you're hearing stuff bad about you, it ain't coming from God. Based on that 16 verses alone, but the, actually the whole Bible would teach that in the context of grace and, and the, uh, the, the act of justification and sanctification that takes place at the cross for any believer. God cannot talk to you any other way because he can't see you any other way. He sees you as Christ. I mean, we need to get that settled. Any thought, any word that comes to you, that's what he's talking about in Isaiah 54. Any word, any tongue that condemns you, you condemn. You have the right to do that because it's not true. Any judgment that's brought against you, we read earlier in this passage, that we're not judged. We can't be judged by anybody. We've already been judged in Christ, so nobody has a right to judge us. Right. Don't judge me. Praise the Lord. You know, you can, see what I'm saying, though? Do you understand? This is liberty. This is freedom. Any thought, any word that comes to you other than declaring your righteousness, your perfection, your goodness, your glory, this goes back to what Suzanne was talking about earlier, too, is not God. It's not true. Praise the Lord. God speaks to you spirit to spirit. It's always going to be, that spirit is perfect. It doesn't get any better. What's being, what's being transformed is the external and our minds. But the spirit cannot be improved upon. It's the spirit of God. We become one with God. Amen. Can't be any better than that. Amen? So, that's God's way of speaking, spirit to spirit. Now, let's look at, just drop down to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy, strife, divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men. That's how Satan speaks to us. By the flesh. Through the flesh. And the unrenewed mind. Because if you're operating from that other perspective, there's no room for any of those issues. Strife. Divisions. Envy. Because you're going to be looking at things the same way Paul described earlier in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 2. I see nothing but Christ. When I look among you, I don't see anything but Jesus. That's how God sees us. He's, that's the spirit. That's how we are to be looking. You know, If you're looking this way, you're not operating by the spirit. It's obvious. And that's what Paul is dealing with. He's saying you're in the flesh. And whenever you're in the flesh, you are subject to to the uh, manipulations and uh, mechanisms of, uh, uh, of Satan. That's where he talks about earlier in Romans uh, chapter 7, about, you know, if I do these things now that I don't want to do, it's not me that's doing them, but it's sin that's in my flesh. Mm -hmm. I'm, it's, it's the carnal, the fleshly behavior. See what I mean? So let's look at verses 4 and 5. For while one saith, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? Who's Apollos? 
but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. So all they did was, well, all they were supposed to do was point you to Jesus. Right. So how can, you know, you've got to be to be divided up over this. Because the result, the end result was to get you to Jesus, not to get you to Paul. Not to get you to Apollos or Benny Hinn or Larry Huck or, you know, Joseph Prince or Nathan Hamlin or Suzanne Gerlach or, you know what I'm saying? It's, when we start doing that, we're missing what we're being directed to. We're no longer beholding with an open face Jesus. We're looking at people. That sets you up for big disappointment. Mm -hmm. And it causes you to, because you're operating from a carnal mind, it causes you then to react carnally. Mm -hmm. yep. Praise the Lord. God doesn't want us occupied with ourselves. Praise God. He doesn't want us occupied with our flesh. You know, just think about this, that, that terminology. We, we fling words around all the time in the English language without even thinking about it, but he wants us to be occupied with Christ. He doesn't want us occupied with us. What, what does that word really, what is it really talking about? Well, it's a word that actually, re, originally it deals with occupying armies. After an army defeats an enemy, it mm -hmm. occupies their territory. We did it in World War II. We occupied Japan. We occupied uh, Europe, uh, Germany, and some of those other areas that were had been hostile to us. Then we defeat them. Then we come in and occupy until we get things back on an even keel to where they're behaving as they should be behaving. So when we're, in other words, what we're saying is if I'm not occupied with Jesus, then Jesus hasn't really overcome the enemy here, right. my flesh. Right. If I'm occupied with my flesh or my weaknesses and my failures, then actually I'm, I'm allowing Satan not to possess me, but to occupy what belongs to Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's what he says to us when he refers to you're of this world, you're not, you're in this world, but you're not of this world, but occupy until I come. Yeah. <clears throat> in other words, I isn't that what he said? Yeah. There, in this world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome this world, and because I've overcome it, I want you to occupy it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. So, uh, God wants our minds occupied with Jesus, because Jesus is the answer to every one of our struggles, to every bit of our pain, to all of our suffering, to every negative situation or circumstance, he's the answer. So we have to be occupied with him. That's what he's talking about when he says, with open face, beholding me, and from glory to glory, you'll be transformed into that same image. So your struggle is overcome. That's a glory. That's glory to God. And because of that overcoming, you're more like Jesus because you've been focused on him and not on the struggle. Amen? The pain, whatever it might be. And you focus on him. Amen? And by beholding him, you overcome the pain. And the result of that is you're more like him. You're being transformed at the same time. Amen? Amen. So... The flesh in us can produce fear and defeat and jealousy, greed, anger, lust, inferiority, condemnation, superiority, arrogance, pride. That's what the flesh does. Praise the Lord. Whenever we're experiencing those things, you know you're in the flesh. Yeah. Praise the Lord. But that's not you. That's why you can't stay there. That's what the devil uses is your flesh. You have to behold Jesus. And when you do that, he flees. As long as we have this body, the flesh is working in us. 
in this life, as long as we're in this life, we're going to have that stuff. But you cannot let that dictate who you are. You resist the occupation and occupy yourself with God. Turn back to the Lord. Don't be preoccupied with you. You're going to get defeated that way. You're going to get beat up. You're going to feel guilty. You're going to be ashamed. You're going to feel, I deserve this bad situation. You know, I can't pray out of it. I can't believe God because after all, look, at I'm such a dead beat. I'm so no good. And I'm just getting what I deserve. All right. Romans 8, uh, verses 1 through 3. Now, he says, because of Christ. We're in Christ. How do I know we're in Christ? Because the moment you're a believer, you are placed in Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, I heard something. Uh, let me see if I can uh, say this. Um, when Abraham, uh, it says Abra that, that Levi and... Um, I'll just say Jacob, but I know it was Levi, and I can't remember who it was. They paid tithes in Abraham. That's what the scripture says. Now, they weren't even born yet. They were generations to come before they would even show up. At the time that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, he didn't have any children. And if he'd had children, it wouldn't have been Jacob. It certainly would have been Levi. Because he would have been Jacob's, one of Jacob's sons. But it says they paid tithes in Abraham. Now, the same is true. This is how God looks at it. So the same thing is true when he says we are in Christ. Therefore, whatever Christ's experience is, it's ours. That's why he says you were crucified with Christ. You were buried with him. You've risen again. You're now seated with him in heavenly places. Because we are in Christ. So whatever Jesus' experience is, is our experience. That goes for the positive as well. That goes for the healing, for the deliverance, for the financial, all everything. You see what I mean? It had nothing to do. Levi and Jacob had nothing to do with Abram paying tithe. But God accounted it to them as though they were paying the tithe because they were in Abram. And this is the way it is with Jesus. He, he declares us to be righteous, us to be holy, us to be perfect, because he has placed us in Christ. That's why he says before the foundation, we're in Christ before the foundation of the world. Because we had to be born again. We're born from above by God through Christ. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? That's how we have to see ourselves. That's why, we are, that's why we are righteous. Okay, so he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Why? How can we be? If we're in Christ, he yeah. is righteous. Therefore, we are righteous simply by the fact that we are in him. Just as they were tithe payers because they were in Abram. Right. Yeah. God said they paid tithe. Yeah. Amen? So, we walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. So the sin in my flesh has already been condemned, because I'm in Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's already been dealt with, is what I'm saying. Even though... It has, some of it hasn't even happened yet. I mean, in space and time. Right. And yet, God declares that it's already been dealt with. The same way he declared that Levi paid tithes, even though he hadn't been born yet. He was two generations away. But God declared him a tithe payer. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Praise the Lord. Amen. When, when Jesus went to the cross, all of these thoughts and emotions that I just spoke of, the hatred, the, you know, the 
division, strife, jealousy, love, of on and on and on, have already been judged and punished at the cross. It's already been dealt with. So we can experience victory over the flesh through the power of the cross. Even though we're still struggling with the flesh. I mean, it's, it's like counterintuitive. It's like you, you can't do this intellectually. Mm-hmm. But it's a done deal. It's finished. Amen. Romans 8 and 1 starts out with, uh, there is therefore now no condemnation. So Romans 8 and 1 starts with no condemnation. The end of Romans 8 it ends up with no separation from the love of Christ. Look at uh, Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, verse 38. For I am persuaded, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. No condemnation gives you revelation. Yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. No condemnation gives you a revelation of God's love and connectedness and inseparable uh, unity with us in Christ. Galatians 5, uh, verse 24. Galatians 5, 24. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Jesus is your new identity, not the flesh. The flesh has been crucified. That's not who you are. The flesh isn't you because it's been crucified with Christ at the cross. You are a new creation in Jesus. Amen? Let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Mike. This is the beholding face-to-face that we're talking about. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Look at this. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The old is gone. The new has come. You know, Old Testament sinners would bring uh, a sheep to the priest. And the sheep got examined, not the sinner. It's obvious uh, the person is a sinner or they wouldn't be bringing the sheep. So the priest examines the sheep to make sure that it is without blemish or without wrinkle. I heard somebody trying to manipulate the message the other day, and he was saying, you know, there's still things we got to do because he's coming back for a church that's without spot and without wrinkle. Yes, he is. And Jesus made us just that. There's nothing for us to do. We've already been made spotless and without wrinkle. He's coming back for a church who has made herself spotless and without wrinkle. How did we do that? By simply believing him. How could the church be anything other than that in the mind of God? He's placed us in him. The church is the body of Christ. I mean, to think otherwise, it it dumbfounds me that people don't see that. That there's something we're supposed to be doing to make ourselves spotless and without wrinkle, and then Jesus will come back. No, I mean, the, the church has been spotless and, and without 
correct from the moment of its inception, from the moment of its birth, and will remain so for eternity. So the sheep is a type of Christ. The priest is a type of God, the Father. Amen? Now, based on that analogy, if God is not examining you today, why are you still focused on you? Why do you continue to examine you? You're in Christ. Believe me, you're going to find flaws and shortcomings and failures because you needed the sheep. Amen. I mean, it's idiotic, but that's your flesh. God's not looking at you. He looked at Jesus. And then he says, you're okay. You're perfect. God is not examining us. He examined Jesus and found him to be the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Amen. And here we are. I mean, th th think about this. Th there's a couple of things going on. One, it's idolatry, because we're taking the place of God and examining ourselves when that's the job of the priest, or in this case, in the true sense of the word, is the case of God to do. And the only thing he examines is Jesus or the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And this would be like the sinner in that day going up and holding the sheep behind him and standing there to see if the uh, high priest could find anything wrong with him. Duh. You brought the sheep. The sheep is the answer, not you. You're the problem. So We've got it backwards. I mean, that's we, this is what the law does. It twists everything and turns everything around to where we misunderstand. But it makes us idolaters. It puts us in the place of God to be examining to see if it's acceptable or not. Only God knows, and God knows no flesh can be justified before him. Nobody's mm -hmm. except Jesus. Mm -hmm. So quit. Stop. Don't listen to the devil. That's the de that's what the devil does. You know, examine yourself. Get introspective here. Let's let's you know, let's meditate on this bad behavior and see if we can't overcome it. Resist the devil. Stop listening to him. And look to Jesus, Father, and finish your love faith. Amen. Amen. Look to Jesus, the Lamb of God. See His perfection as your perfection. See, his innocence as your innocence. His righteousness as your righteousness. And you'll see yourself transformed from glory to glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap tonight. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise God. <laughs> so it's always a question of perspective. And we need to have the perspective of Christ who has declared you to be perfect, without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle, holy and perfect before God. Listen, man, that's the good news. That is the good news of the gospel. So, seek God and resist the devil. Submit yourself to God. What does that mean? It means put yourself in a position where you accept whatever it is he has said. Submit yourself to his word. His word says you are perfect, you are righteous, you are as good as it gets. So submit to that truth, and in doing that, you're resisting the devil automatically because you're not listening to his lies. You're not listening to his accusations and his condemnation. Why should you? Because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There cannot be. The devil, believe me, see, the devil doesn't come before God accusing the brethren. He's not allowed before God anymore. That ended with Jesus. Now what's with, with in, the, in, the, in the presence of God or in the, uh, the throne 
is not the devil coming to accuse, but Jesus standing there declaring innocence. Amen. Praise the Lord. All God ever hears about you is good stuff. I mean, if you want to break this down into the, you know, Jesus is talking to him and all this kind of stuff. The truth is he's just there. That in itself is the evidence that we are perfect, without flaw, without blemish, totally accepted by God. Amen. No condemnation. Righteous, innocent, pure, holy. When you grasp that reality of being in Christ, you start expecting what Christ has coming, what Christ deserves. His inheritance, everything. All that God has is yours in Christ. And you have every reason to expect good things every day. Should never be thinking about, oh, you know, like some, it's been going so good, something bad's got to happen. No, just more good's got to happen. Amen. And the more you focus on that reality of who you are in Christ, you'll be transformed into that same image. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed in Jesus' name. See you back here Sunday, Easter, Resurrection Day. Hallelujah. Amen. Hi, Jamie. How are you doing?